So again, welcome everyone and welcome to managing the online teaching workload. So this is something that I think a lot of us struggle with. And we're going to go ahead and we'll just get started with some uh, introductions and then also some goals for the workshop. Um, there's just a couple of us, so you can either come on the microphone or you can type in the chat, whatever you prefer. Um, but who are you? What are you teaching? Um, and what are you hoping to get out of this workshop? I can start, uh, Jen, if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Lei Zhao, and uh, I'm a professor at the finance department. And I uh, teach you finance 320. It's an introductory finance class. Uh, for all finance students. Oh, actually all four business uh, school students. So the class was taught in online format, both asynchronous and asynchronous uh, in the past. And uh, we're expecting to uh, get rid of the uh, synchronous online class moving to purely uh, asynchronous class. And of course we have the, uh, the uh, mass face-to-face -face class um, what I find uh, teaching the online class uh, over the last couple of years is that uh, seem to be never stopping in the sense that uh, with a face to face class, you have a designated uh, class time and then you have the office hours and pretty much that's it, you know, uh, and with online class, um, you will have emails drip in. Uh, at every weird hours, and I was trying to email back the students as soon as possible. Now, when you have 20 students in the class, it's not a big deal, but uh, when I teach a mass class of 100 some students, that can get a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say that whether you use the words annoying, but um, it takes a lot of time to uh, respond to individual uh, emails. So I don't want well, to learn something. How do I handle uh, kind of a lot of emails uh, from students? Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Jen Jacobs. I'm an associate professor in the kinesiology and physical education department. Um, I primarily teach in-person classes, but this summer I'm teaching an asynchronous online class, um, which is the first time I'll be teaching asynchronously. I've taught synchronous online before, um, so I'm just looking to learn if there are any more um, engaging strategies to keep students really interested in, and feeling like they can interact in a course that doesn't really have a, a a synchronous component. Excellent. I love that both of you um, commented that you're teaching asynchronously. Um, and, you know, I think instructors and students sometimes have different perspectives on this. As a student, I love asynchronous courses because I know I'm trying to cram in my studies you know, with everything else, with full-time jobs, families. Um, so this allows me to kind of to pick and choose these hours when I'm working on, on my homework. Um, it's usually very off strange hours. <laughs> so, um, but for the teachers, you're right. It, it's the sense of, oh my gosh, this class never ends. It follows me everywhere I go. So great, I'm excited. Okay. So you may have already answered this. Um, we'll get to that in just a second. So our goals for the workshop are just what can we do to save time? manage those student expectations. Um, you know, I think there's two categories to that as well. Uh, manage the student expectations for you. You know, what are they demanding out of you as their teacher, um, but also um, elevating their, their thinking to what are their expectations for themselves. Um, and then of course, just increasing efficiency. And I use that as a blanket statement. If you increase your efficiency as an instructor, it usually has that trickle down effect. Um, and I think our students are going to become a little bit more efficient too. So, all right, now we're going to get to that question that I just mentioned. You may have already kind of touched on this um, a little bit um, in your previous answer, but, you know, in your opinion, what is the most difficult aspect of managing the online teaching workload? Uh, to me, I just mentioned a bit earlier, um, I constantly uh, uh, contacted by the student by emails, and a lot of times the emails are regarding the same kind of questions, same type of a problem we have with face-to-face -face class, I can explain the whole thing for everybody and be done with it. You know, with online class, particularly asynchronous classes, I tend to answer uh, emails of the same question multiple times again, again, again. So that's kind of like how kind of 
try and learn some tricks from you of how to improve the efficiency. Great. For me, I would say, honestly, it's keeping my motivation up. I think online classes just feel like um, lots of busy work for me versus like being able to think about actually like these are my students, these are their faces, these are their majors. That's sort of what keeps me motivated as a professor. So um, just sort of the the like staying pulled in and, and keeping like interactive is, is challenging for me. I think that's a fair assessment on both counts. So I, I came up with a slide for you, the, the teacher struggle, um, because I, I always thought it was so funny. I would have friends and family and they would just be like, oh yeah, teaching's great. You know, that's it's one of the easiest professions. I'm like, it is. I'm like, oh yeah, you get so much time off. And that was just baffling to me. I was just like, I, I don't think we do. I was just like, and you know, the part about teaching is that the hours that we put in often aren't reflected in the hours that were, you know, actually in the teaching environment itself. And so we've got all these things that we're trying to juggle, right? You're, you're balancing those emails. Maybe I should have made that the biggest bubble. Um, <laughs> so you've got grading. Um, you have to actually create your Blackboard course. That takes a, a tremendous amount of time, actually situating your online course. Uh, there's that still the class time, the actual delivery, uh, whether that's asynchronous or synchronous. Uh, I mean, that is the expectation that we are delivering lessons to our students. So that has to be accounted for office hours. And then I'm sure there are more bubbles that I could have put on here. Uh, you know, we could have been talking about department meetings, right? Uh, so all sorts of things that are going on. And, and then you feel like your, your teaching load never ends particularly for online learning, because now we have technology at our fingertips. And if you're anything like me, your phone is going off morning, noon, and night because you have your emails uh, attached to your cell phone. So I think it's good to recognize that we are struggling and uh, we have a tremendous workload to balance. I think that's probably the first step is just admitting we are overworked. So the way that I have set up this workshop is um, basically three different segments um, and you can look at them as pie pieces. I think some of my colleagues call them the pillars of online education, um, but call it what you like. Um, it kind of starts with designing your course, the actual delivery, um, and then also the, the grading. So um, I'm going to try to address all three of those pieces uh, today. And I figure since the very first thing you do is you actually build your course, um, that's one of the, the things that we'll start with. So we're going to go ahead with the design part. So I have some ideas here for you for tips for saving your time, being more efficient, um, you know, making the, the most of your time because it is valuable. So all of the links that you see on here today, I'm also going to send to you in a follow up email. So don't panic um, about trying to, to copy those down. I will send all of that to you along with the recording of this workshop. But uh, one of the first ones I like to talk about are the CIDL course templates. Have either of you looked at those? Heard of them? Give me to put you on the spot. I have uh, used that one uh, for one of uh, my classes, but I'm still using the old um, Blackboard. I know someday we'll have to transfer to uh, Ultra. Is it called Ultra or Ultra? Whatever. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, yes, we have course templates, um, and we are getting rid of Blackboard Original, which I know has uh, devastated a lot of our faculty. Um, but this comes from Blackboard themselves, um, not from our department or anything like that. I'm not torturing you. Um, Blackboard Original has been around for close to 15 years, which for technology is actually um, very archaic, actually, if you think about it. Um, if, if you could imagine having a cell phone for 15 years, you know, that kind of puts it into perspective for you. So now we're moving to Blackboard Ultra. This fall will be the last time you can teach with Blackboard Original. And then starting in the spring, um, everybody's going to be moved to Ultra. And so one of the things that we noticed with Ultra is that when you uh, open up your course, um, I will answer that question just a moment later. Um, 
But when you open up your course in Ultra, it, it feels almost um, blank. And, and as an instructor, that can be very intimidating. You, you just don't see much on your screen. And so what we built are these course templates and they are for every field, every discipline, and they are 100% customizable. Uh, but we built in some information that is universal for all courses, such as things like uh, netiquette policies, you know, how people should be interacting and behaving online. Uh, we have folders with, court, uh, with student information so that they know where to go for all sorts of outside resources, such as tutoring or the DRC um, and many other different resources that we have on campus. So uh, we've got these templates and that's actually kind of what you're seeing here on this screen. So uh, it's a great time saver. You can add your own content to it. If there are sections you're not using, you can delete it. Um, so again, it is 100% customizable, but we basically just created a template for you um, for your course for online. And we put placeholders for places where you're supposed to upload your syllabus or upload your course schedule. And one of the things that you'll see here on this um, screen image is it says course Q&A, which for both of you, if you're doing asynchronous courses, I highly recommend. Um, have a discussion board that's open the entire course. Um, make sure it's not graded, but that way students can ask questions there. And um, if you don't respond right away, some of their peers might know the answer too. So um, that's a great way to kind of cut back on some of those emails that they send you. So if you've never um, heard of the CIDL course templates, I encourage you to check them out, think about it. Uh, could be a game changer for you. Um, and to your question that you typed in the chat, yes, you can copy items from original into Ultra. It does not always appear the way you think it will. Um, it is not always a clean conversion process. So, um, you know, I would, I would give yourself time and space uh, to, to adjust things as needed, or you might not like the appearance and you would prefer to build from scratch. So um, I do want you to be aware of that. Yes, you can um, convert it, but it, it might surprise you. So yes, the course templates are, I think, one of my, my favorite things. They were actually designed by our instructional design team. What that also does is it helps your students um, intuitively navigate your course. I find that students tend to email you when they can't find things, if they don't know where they belong, if they're confused. Um, and so one of the things that we encourage is to come up with a course that is consistent in its layout. Um, so typically we recommend if you have a 16 week course, have 16 modules, one module per week of the course. And so that's what you see up here on the screen. Um, go ahead and label them with the dates. Let your students know um, which, which unit they're in. You're going to have students who kind of drop off the grid for a while, but once they show up, um, at least they can just look at the folders and know which one you know, or module they belong in. Something else you'll want to think about is being consistent with your due dates. So. Um, a very common example is saying that everything is due on Sunday by 11.59 p.m. I'm not saying that you're going to have your students do the same thing over and over again every single week, uh, but just that there's kind of a certain uh, predictability to the pattern of when their, when their assignments are due, and they'll be better able to regulate their own schedule with that in mind. I would also suggest having separate documents for your syllabus and for your weekly schedule, uh, just because you want students to be able to click on that schedule. Um, you don't want to have them to scroll through it, and so they can just keep going there to refer to what's due. So um, think about all of those things as you're navigating your um, online course as an instructor, but also what it would look like from the student perspective. So uh, Lee, this might be something that you're interested in as well. We have what is called the Blackboard Ultra Self-Paced Workshop. We offer um, three-week academies for um, transitioning to the Ultra course view. So if you're interested in that, we have another one um, coming up here um, in, towards the end of May. But if you don't want to sign up for that, we have a self-paced one. 
So uh, this just walks you through how to use Blackboard Ultra. I think as an instructor, sometimes we spend so much time trying to learn the LMS system. Uh, that's where our time goes. So um, this might be something that you like. It'll just uh, show you how to do tests, or how to do assignments, or how to um, set up your grade book. So this could be beneficial as well. We also have another um, website, pardon me, website that my uh, one director keeps updated on a regular basis. Um, it's a wealth of information. And so these are all the new features that are coming out in Ultra, right? If we're going to be teaching online, we just want to have at our fingertips, like, oh, how do I do this? Um, what's new? Um, what, are, what are these different features that keep rolling out? Um, so this will help you just stay on top of the kind of the, the workflow of navigating Ultra. Sometimes I think we just have to get down to, to the technical pieces. Um, so these are all things that can help you with that. And of course, I always recommend um, just coming to us and asking for assistance. So we offer one-on-one -on -one consultants, and I particularly recommend these um, for things like setting up your Blackboard um, gradebook. I know this is something that's very time consuming. It's not necessarily intuitive. So um, if you just want to have somebody um, screen share with you, look at your course and help you set up your grade book, um, you know, I think we could do that probably in under 60 minutes with you. So um, don't struggle it alone. And of course, we can do other things too. Um, so anything that you have a question about with your course, whether it is technical functions or if you want to talk about best practices and pedagogy, we're available. So you can just get an individual session tailored to you. Whatever you want to talk about, we're available. All right. So that's kind of the design piece. I feel like the design piece is really kind of the technical heavy part. Um, so now we get to actually talk more about the um, delivery of the course. So this is um, a a website that we have, um, our regular and substantive interaction policy. And I threw the screenshot up here because I didn't know if you had seen the site or um, if you had heard about it, but regular and substantive interaction is actually a federal policy. So it means that as instructors, we have to have ongoing communication with our students. We can't just basically set our classes and forget about them. We, we have to keep checking in and interacting with them. And again, in the online environment, that is a little bit harder. Uh, we're missing that face-to-face -face component. So there's a ton of different tips and suggestions on here. And they talk about what is considered regular and substantive, substantive interaction. Um, but it also clarifies uh, things that it's not. Sometimes um, I think faculty put too much pressure on themselves. And so there's a lot of clarity here. You have a chance. Um, you'll want to check out the site. And again, I didn't include the link on the slide, but I'll also send it in that follow up email. So, again, microphone or chat, whatever you prefer. Uh, but what is your approach to responding to emails? And um, even think about frequency here. I'm trying, okay. I'm always trying to uh, email back to my student as soon as possible. Uh, because if I do not, then I tend to forget about it. And the student come back three days later and say, wow, you never respond to my email. But then that creates a problem in that I'm constantly uh, get disrupted uh, by students. Jen says she's getting better at trying it within one to two days during working hours or first thing in the morning. Excellent. So I, I'm glad I put the slide in here and I'm glad that you brought this up initially, um, you know, kind of during our conversations. It's hard to think about uh, putting away your, your technology. Uh, it follows us everywhere. It's at our fingertips. But then it also creates kind of this sense that we're on call. And I don't know if as instructors, if we really are on call or if we're giving our best attention to our students if we um, develop that type of uh, mindset. So let's take a look at some of these things.
talk to your students about time and it it does actually have to be a discussion. I really, really like the idea of putting all of these different ideas into your syllabus. I actually had an instructor many years ago say that my syllabus is my contract to you. Um, and, and that kind of kind of reframed for me what a syllabus really is. Um, so it's great to put these things in writing. Uh, but talk about it with your students. And so here are some things to think about and to think about what works for you, what works well for me, um, you know, might not work well for Jen. So um, come up with policies that work for your individual schedule. So um, make sure you talk about what days you're going to be meeting if you have any synchronous course sessions or if you're doing completely asynchronous, go ahead and document that. If you are having a fully asynchronous course, you might consider even just having the very first day of class being a synchronous course session so that you can get to see everybody, talk to them, they get to hear your voice. Um, you could always record it if people can't attend, uh, but that's always something to consider as well. Let them know about your response time. Um, you know, when do you want to respond? And I actually like to schedule this. Um, so you can think about, you know, what is a normal work schedule for people? Oftentimes we think of Monday through Friday, nine to five. You could tell your students, that's when I respond. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to respond on the weekends, but um, please feel free to send me your emails. I know that we all have different schedules. So my hours that I'm available might not line up with yours, but go ahead and send me that message. I promise I value it and I'll get to it as soon as possible. So have that discussion with your students. You might have students who are in different time zones. You might have students who work second or third shift. So, you know, it can be difficult to try to rearrange your schedule for them. So instead of trying to do that, just set aside a block of time where you're willing to respond to emails and, and just reassure them that I will respond to you. Uh, and, and students usually are pretty okay with that. They, they don't feel like you've abandoned them. So um, also talk to them um, about due dates, um, things like that. I, I know that's common sense, um, but list it in multiple places, put it on the module, put it in the schedule. Um, you could put it again in the syllabus if you wanted, things like that. Um, let them know when their modules are going to open. Some students want to work ahead, others, um, don't that's fine too but you know are all of them open or are they going to unlock every week on monday or tuesday um, so just let them know how your course is set up and how they can access their material and then the final one that i have on here and i think that this has been working really well is to consider adding an estimated time needed to complete an activity um, students oftentimes underestimate how much work is involved for a particular project. So you can always say, I understand this is just an estimate. I, I want you to understand that as well. Some of you may work a little bit faster. Some of you may work a little bit slower, but this should give you an idea about where to divide your time. Um, and that's a great scheduling tool for them. So you can again, put this directly into the module or you could just put it in the instructions of the activity. Um, so I usually make it, you know, the last sentence of the, the instructions, and I'll just put estimated one to two hours or something like that. Um, so that, that can help students, again, self-pace. Right. We do also have some other options here for the delivery, because again, we're trying to uh, lighten a little bit of your workload. Your students have to meet you halfway. It's not this idea that you are delivering your course content into space and hoping that it sticks with your students. Um, so we're gonna try to interact with them. So some of the things you can do is you can utilize a peer review. You can ask your students um, to turn in an assignment. You give a specific due date for when their assignment is due. And then you give them a second due date for when they have to review their peers work. So this is really nice. This kind of puts some ownership on them. Um, you get to decide how many student peer reviews they have to do, whether it's one, two, three, um, whatever you want to do. 
Um, it appears anonymous from the student perspective, meaning that they will not know which peers reviewed their work, but as the instructor, you will see all of that information from the gradebook. So um, you will have an easy time tracking who said what. So again, it's a really nice feature. Um, it takes a little bit of this burden off of you because these are adult learners, so they can handle it. And then I have five other tips for you for lightening this kind of burden or this workload. Bring in guest speakers, um, or again, for asynchronous, that could be uh, guest speakers who just do a video recording. But again, it doesn't always have to be you supplying the content. So think about that a little bit as you're organizing your online course. Incorporate student presentations. I really like doing this even in an asynchronous course. Um, you can ask them to upload their uh, content, their presentation, or their video to a discussion board. When it's in a Blackboard discussion board, everybody can view it. So um, it, it's a really nice way to make sure we're doing some community building, even asynchronously. Ask your students for what I call exit slips. Uh, but this is an opportunity where you ask students, what did you learn? What surprised you? What is still confusing? Uh, get that feedback from your students so that you can figure out where you need to spend more time with them. It's particularly valuable, again, in these online environments where sometimes we don't have that um, normal interaction. You also, I think, need to really always think about follow-up asynchronous activities. Um, so I mentioned my background is in English, and I always knew walking into my classroom that if English 101 and English 102 were not required for every single degree program, about 75% of my students would not be there, um, which actually I found very liberating. I mean, because once you know that, you, you really feel like all you can do is go up from there. And so I knew that my students really didn't want to do the reading, but it was crucial for the next step of their coursework. So anytime that I had reading activities, I had to do some sort of a follow-up to ensure that they actually read the material. Now, as a faculty member, that can be a little bit daunting because you're like, well, does that mean I have to grade a whole bunch of things? Uh, you know, do I have to keep grading uh, reading quizzes? Not necessarily. So you could ask them to do these activities, whether it's watching a recorded lecture, whether it's reading an article, listening to a podcast, um, but then you have to give them a task. So they're going to do something with that reading. Right? Now that you've finished this reading, um, this is your activity. Or the next module, I'm going to ask you specific questions about your reading, and you're going to keep connecting your coursework. And you do this, I think, a lot in synchronous sessions and in face-to-face -face environments. So you just kind of have to reimagine it in an asynchronous online teaching experience, right? If you asked your students to read several chapters for homework, you would tell them the next time you come to class, I'm going to call on some of you to answer questions about the reading. Um, and it was fair game who you called on and what questions you asked. But again, it was this expectation like no that you don't want to do the reading, but I'm going to check in with you anyway. So uh, make sure you incorporate those um, follow-up activities. They do not always have to be graded, uh, but they do have to become kind of a source of information in order to move forward to the next piece. And then pepper in discussion board replies, and I feel like this always deserves an honorable mention here in this type of a workshop. I think some instructors feel that they have to reply to every single discussion board post, and that's very time consuming, but it also detracts from the student conversation. Discussion boards are supposed to be led by the students. I think it's a wise idea to pop in there and to let students know when they you know, stumbled across a really great idea, or maybe if they're getting off topic, you can kind of rein them back in. They're going to note your presence, and that's important, but it's not this idea that you have to reply to every single student. Does that sound fair? Okay. Yeah. 
who's never used a discussion board. Um, I find discussion boards have a lot of different purposes. You don't have to use it um, the same way as other instructors, but it's this idea that anything you post in a discussion board could be viewed by other students in the course. Um, so that's kind of a nice way to increase interaction. Yes, I, I hope you can give it a try. Um, if nothing else, you could set one up in your course, like we said, just for the Q&A section. So um, students will start asking each other questions instead of just emailing you privately. Okay, um, so we get to also outline expectations for communication, um, communication standards for yourself as well as for your students. So this is a little bit small, um, but I, I swiped this from one of my colleagues. This is something she actually used in her syllabus. And um, so she says she'll respond within 48 hours, ah, not even 24 hours, um, 48 hours. And that's still reasonable, except for weekends. Um, and she also says, I will post announcements to Blackboard. So that's another way to communicate with students. Um, and when you do that, there's often a button you can click to send it to their email. So. And she has expectations for them. Check your email regularly format emails appropriately. She even had uh, an example of what a, a scholarly, you know, professional email looks like from students um, and avoid emailing her at the last minute. I'm also a fan of putting an away message on your Outlook calendar. This is so helpful. Um, this reassures students that you've received their message, you're going to read it, you're going to get back to them, um, just not right this minute. So this is kind of one of my example ones. It's polite, it's courteous, it says, hey, thank you for contacting me. Um, language is always a, a big piece here, right? They can't hear your voice. So, uh, you know, try to make sure that your your language choices are welcoming. Uh, you do want your students to ask questions um, and to engage with you and to engage with their coursework. Um, but it also just creates a nice little boundary and says, hey, I can't, I can't be at my computer every minute of every day. So I'm a big fan. If you have not used the away message in Outlook, um, if you ever need help configuring that, let me know. And finally, we have to talk about students, how much time they should be studying. Um, and I feel like this often gets overlooked. So if anybody's feeling brave, when you talk with your students, what's the rule of thumb? Um, you know, what's, what's a general standard that we would use for the anticipated amount of outside study time? for any college course. I always address this issue on the first day of my class and I tell my student, I don't know. I don't know how much time you need to study for the class because everybody's prepared differently for the class. Somebody are very good at math and they can breeze through the class very easily. Other students are struggling with the basics and uh, don't even know how to do the basic math. They're going to take millions, spend millions, millions of hours on the class. So I, I, I always tell students, I don't know. You have to figure it out a way, uh, figure it out yourself, probably by, you know, the first months of the uh, course. You have a little bit better idea what, what the course is about, and then you're going to know uh, how much time you need to spend. That's kind of like what I tell my students.
Okay, are we are we back working? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, well, I never lost you, so I could hear you the entire time. Um, I was told I had no permission to um, access my microphone. So, <laughs> um, gotta love Blackboard. All right. Um, so, thank you. I, I'm really glad that you are talking about that. And then, Jen, I was watching in the chat, you said you'd always heard um, 10 hours. So, where do we think these rules of thumb are coming from? At some point, I thought I was told that's like a general university like formula that when I have done independent studies um, as a course before, like I was I was mentored into sort of making it so that students have 10 hours of work per week. And that's what fits the credit of a three credit hour course. Yeah, it is. It's based on credit hour. Um, so, but but some people don't know this, some people haven't heard it. Um, so the general rule of thumb that's out there for many universities, and again, it's just a general guideline, it's not a hard policy or anything like that, but for every credit hour of a course, students are expected on average to complete two to three hours of outside study time. Um, so since we're looking at generally three credit hour courses that averages out to uh, about six to nine hours of study time per week and it could be more especially if you're dealing with uh, graduate students um, those who are either in doctoral courses or master's programs um, but that generally gives us a, a pretty good um, idea of how much time they should anticipate studying so six to nine hours outside of regular course time and if you're teaching asynchronously you may want to tell your students that they need to tack on additional time uh, just for what we would have considered regular classroom content if we had been in any other type of modality so um, that is a guideline but um, to Lee's point things vary. So some weeks of your course might be more content heavy or project heavy than others. Uh, and that's to be expected. I, I think, you know, students know this and there are peak busy periods. And um, it's okay to tell them that, yes, six to nine hours is, is a general guideline. Um, I'll try to let you know which weeks are going to be the heaviest so you can plan accordingly. Um, and that goes back to that idea of you may want to write into the instructions of your, your different activities and assessments how much time you think they might need to spend on it to truly be uh, successful. So again, it's not just all about telling teachers um, how they need to communicate and how they need to be available. Um, it's also talking to students and saying, you also need to hold yourselves accountable too. Um, I'm gonna meet you halfway, um, but I, I also need you to put in the work. Okay, so any questions on that or do we wanna move into the final segment for grading? Sure, okay. So one of the ideas here that I have a uh, nice segue here is to stagger the grading flow. So this was actually a screenshot that I took of one of my um, calendars. And so as you can see, uh, this gives me an overview of things that are due. This actually could look very similar to what your students have, right? If they're taking more than one course at a time, uh, this shows them how many things are due. Um, so I, I want you to think about this. Uh, this is what it looks like from the student perspective, but also this is what it looks like from the instructor perspective. I would tell you to try to alternate some of the grading functions that you have to complete. So if something large is due on Sunday the 26th at 1159 p.m., um, you're gonna be using the rest of that week probably to do some grading. So the following week, it, you might wanna make it a little bit lighter. Um, and creating this stagger is going to help keep your momentum going, but also your students. Um, if you have five things due every single week, I think you're both going to experience burnout. So um, 
try taking kind of this broad overview of your calendar. Um, a lot of my colleagues like to look at their calendar at the, you know, the day-to-day -day scope. I always zoom out. I look at it from the month perspective. So I recommend that you take a look at that and see how your grading workflow looks visibly on the calendar. And is this something that's going to be manageable both for you and for your students? I'm also a really big fan of using interactive rubrics. I never realized how much time these actually save me as I'm going through the grading process. So do either of you use interactive rubrics in Blackboard? Nope, not interactive, but you've used them. Um, they've been kind of a game changer for me. I, I really hadn't played with them too much, um, but I, I really appreciated them. So I, I thought I would show you um, just some screenshots of what they look like. So um, the, the first one, number one on the left there, as you can see, this is an actual example of something um, that I've graded. It was out of 90 points. And so there were four different categories that the student could be graded on, completeness, organization, consistency, and ready to begin building. Um, so it was a project where they were building something. If, um, so like the top one there, that was for completeness, you know, that was a total of 15 points. And, you know, if I had said, no, it was not complete, I'm only giving you zero, that grade pill at the top automatically would have changed and would have reflected that the student earned 75 out of 90 points. So um, super fast, um, you know, just as far as entering numbers goes. And it also helps me as an instructor uh, regulate the amount of time that I, I spend on each student submission, because I do want to be cognizant of how much time I spend reading each student's uh, submission. I want to try to roughly be consistent. So, you know, I don't want to spend 10 minutes reading one student's paper and only two on somebody else's. So um, having this rubric here, it, it actually kind of sets a, a pace for me. I have to go through each of the four different categories to grade the student. And so in addition to doing that, um, you can see in the side, um, or I shouldn't say the slide, but in the image number two, there's um, different categories of um, points that they can accrue. So I had exceeds expectations, meets expectations, or does not meet expectations. I had a very plain, very basic rubric. Uh, you can make yours far more complex. You could have a lot more. You know, you could have had 25 points, 20 points, 10 points, or zero points. Um, so you can make them as complex as you like or as simple it's up to you you can reuse rubrics which is really nice so once you've created it you can just copy it to another assignment uh, so you don't have to recreate it every single time and then um, once i i click on a category so this one was ready to begin building you'll notice there's a little purple icon next to it that means i left the student a comment um, and i could just give them feedback right there in that particular category um, so if you've never tried interactive rubrics, I highly recommend them. I, I can't believe how much time uh, it saved me. And people from Blackboard do not pay me to say that. It just truly did save me a bunch of time. To go along with that, um, there's the idea of minimal marking. So this, um, again, kind of goes back to the days when we actually received papers with uh, ink on them. I know everything's kind of automated now, um, but still there were times where students would get back papers and they would almost look like they were bleeding ink. And so we wanna get away from that idea. Instead, we wanna focus on minimal marking. When we give comments to our students, we, we want them to really have an impact. So um, it helps you to avoid things like auto-correcting. It does save you time. Um, but the, the rule of thumb with minimal marking is focus on future improvements. So um, if you're going to give your student any type of constructive criticism, make sure it is something that they can practice or revise. Um, you don't want to discourage your student. You don't want to tell them, 
okay, um, this did not work, we're gonna move on to the next exercise. Um, that, that can actually really impact students and their cognitive process. So um, if you're telling them, you know, you need some improvement here, um, either you can revise this assignment or you're gonna have opportunities to continue practice working on this in our next follow-up assignment. Um, and then it draws them into the revision process as well. Make sure to um, really point out things that they do well. Um, sometimes students don't realize how much you really enjoyed, you know, reading their work, um, the, the progress that they're making. So make sure to highlight the things they're doing well. Uh, if you take the time to do that, it's more likely that they're going to, to repeat it in the next process. All right, so for things like quizzes, uh, we have automated feedback options, which are great. Um, this can help students uh, learn from their mistakes. And there are settings, again, in Blackboard um, for when and how you release that feedback. So, um, you know, if you're worried that some other students might still be taking the quiz, you can say, do not release feedback until all items have been graded. Um, so that way, then all the students get the information at the same time. But um, again, it's just a, a quick way to let students know where they made an error. You can give them some incentive or some hints as to where they may have um, gotten off track. All right, I think we're doing pretty well in time here. So we have just a couple more. We have Blackboard Annotate for customizable feedback. Now I know this is an ultra and original. Um, if you have never used this one, so I again, I've highlighted there's the rubric, there's the feedback, um, but then there's this third bo uh, red box kind of in the middle of the screen. And this is where you can create your own content library. You can create things like stamps, um, and this is where you can um, save some frequently used comments so you don't have to keep typing them over and over again. And I, again, find that to be a great time saver. It's very efficient. And it also is kind of predictable for students, right? Um, some, some faculty shy away from it and they say, no, I wanna make sure that I give um, customized feedback to each student. Certainly you want to do that, but um, if you're having an entire section of your course devoted to research, some of your comments are, are going to be reoccurring. And so it's really nice just to have this library of commentary that you can repurpose. So if you haven't tried that, um, that again could really help you. And I think this is my last one. If you've never tried this, uh, this might change things for you. Um, if you're supplying feedback, you don't just have to give written comments. You can also do audio and video feedback directly from the gradebook. So why is that easier? Well, you can, I think I, I showed you where it's located. You click a little plus button, you click record, turn on your webcam, and you just talk to the student. You get to tell them what you thought of their assignment, what they did well, maybe some areas uh, for revision or for um, further refinement. And then you uh, just stop the recording and you move on to the next student. So uh, speaking in front of your webcam can be tremendously faster than if you were just to type comments for every single student in your course. And students actually may really enjoy receiving some other type of feedback. Um, so consider that a perk for them as well. All right, we have eight minutes. So Q&A, anything goes. I really don't have any question, Megan, but I really thought um, discussion board would be a really cool tool that I probably should use in the future, particularly if a student asks a common question in an email, I probably can uh, answer the email and simultaneously put on the discussion board such that students have the similar questions, probably not going to email me again. So that's something cool. I'm going to try it out. Thank you. Excellent. I love it. Simple solutions. Wonderful. Jen's thinking about using interactive rubrics and adding estimated time to complete an assignment. 
I, I find them helpful. I, students have been really receptive to it and then they know um, kind of how to plan their day or how to plan their week. So uh, it, it feels like, you know, we're, we're agreeing together to, to work towards the common goal of improving their academic experience. So I'll hang around, but otherwise, um, if you have no other questions, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you both.